Okay, very good morning. Thursday, the 11th of October. I'm going to discuss the kind of bloodbath that occurred, as Bloomberg are terming it, um, from overnight in the Asia Pac session. I think that's a little bit overdone, uh, in my opinion, and I'll I'll discuss why in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, but certainly, as per usual, I have a day off the desk, and the whole market has uh, one of its biggest corrections, as per normal. So. For any of those lovers of volatility, I'll do the briefing and I will depart um, if that is your wish. But um, statistically speaking, looking at the S&P 500 in front of me at the moment, and you know, obviously, I, you know, one of the first questions, given the fact that I wasn't sat in front of the screens yesterday, was when when did the actual selling occur? And I, I do think that this is an important thing in terms of your approach to the intraday. Uh, you know, kind of strategy in the sense that really it's not European or UK participants that are driving the kind of global narrative, it's the Americans. And when they come in, that's when you get the much more kind of clearer, I think, directional move in the market. And, and just given the, the time frame, the largest volume comes through and then therefore the associated move that follows. So uh, as per kind of the usual time stamp it gets to the cash open and then things certainly look like they livened up yesterday and you know one of the biggest down days in fact that we've had in the S&P since February um, let's just have a look on a daily continuation to put this into a bit of perspective now one of the questions was well you know how violent was that sell-off well if you thought yesterday was was spicy go back to February and the move was actually, from a percentage point of view, although it was a period of two days combining, it was basically twice the size February sell-off than what we've had so far with this latest kind of, if you want to call it a correction, um, at this point. So it's nowhere near the same as yet, whether or not we get a second down day to, to match that kind of levels. Uh, obviously, things uh, could go that way. Uh, but one of the other interesting things here, if we look at a daily continuation, of course, is if we start putting a uh, another study on here. So give me one moment uh, while I add this on. And if I adjust this line, it's a 200-day moving average. And the reason why we look at this is because going to take this all the way back to basically this was the flash kind of move that we had uh, during the e-referendum which obviously was a surprise for not just us but the whole global market was very unsure of what the repercussion of that was and um, we had a big down day at that moment in time you can see was very quickly recovered then we had obviously the shock of Donald Trump winning the presidency that one night of downward movement a loss of 5% in overnight trade on Globex before we came surging back. And then you can see, if I just remove the February dip, uh, but to where we are at the moment, uh, if I remove that one as well, we've had on various different occasions, the 200 uh, DMA has been a really uh, key supportive level, which the market, in this case the S&P, has always responded to thus far. Uh, over the last kind of two year period. Now, what was interesting, of course, is that when we start looking at the the details here, the market actually moved below there. And this is, I think, one of what is a collection of reasons of why the market kind of came under pressure yesterday. Uh, so technically, when you see the breach of these key long term levels, what tends to happen is you get these forced in then momentum sellers uh, it triggers a lot of the uh, the algorithms to take advantage of the move. That then kind of snowballs into other systems which will pick up on those trades as the volume comes through and so on. Other things, though, to be aware of, of course, is the uh, earnings season. And a lot of people are looking at the fact that, you know, last corporate earnings season was quite spectacular in terms of the uh, net benefit of the corporate tax cuts. And we've had these really quite crazy elevated forward-looking kind of profit expectations going forward uh, as a byproduct of a lot of the changes that have come from the Trump administration. Question mark is though is that you know if this trade war continues if it gets gradually worsens the situation for not just 
uh, China and elsewhere, but also for corporate America to sustain these quite wild trajectory profit targets, then this also is a cause for concern because a number of US North American companies have been bringing that to the investors' attention. This, of course, comes well-timed because earnings season, the reason why people are talking about this is earnings season kicks off basically the big companies tomorrow. You get the big banks, so JP, City, Wells Fargo typically then will come out pre-market tomorrow and that will commence then the latest earnings season round. So maybe a little bit of apprehension ahead of that as well. And then not forgetting the bigger picture, of course, which is trade wars, China coming back from that golden week holiday uh, and they've kind of come in. The situation is deteriorating at this point. Uh, and then uh, the market suffering under these kind of multiple reasons. Uh, biggest loss since February then for the S&P. The Nasdaq, of course, you know, the, the stronger you rise, the harder you fall. You could almost argue with the FANG stocks had their worst day yesterday since at least 2012. Uh, collectively across the FANG basket, $125 billion wiped off market caps, just to give it a little bit of a, a real context to it. You can see here, last time it was down this kind of 6% region, way off the charts here. You've got to go back multiple years. Uh, but I don't think that that's, again, cause for concern. Let's not forget that the N in FANG is Netflix and their shares had been up as much as in excess of 130% for the year, um, way outperforming the benchmark index. And so a pullback of you know 6% in some of these names, I don't think is uh, just yet is cause for panic. Uh, but certainly I think it's just uh, more susceptible, of course, the tech. So NASDAQ as an index when you do get these big down days, it does tend to underperform, just given the nature of the moves that have been occurring in recent times. So even though the S&P had the biggest fall since Feb, it was the biggest fall for the NASDAQ in seven years. Um, the selling then, this is when you get that kind of feed through uh, where the regional move then, uh, the Asia Pacific session picks up the baton, carries that through. Not that there's anything particularly new going on in Asia, it's just that they then have to reprice for this move and this carry on of negative sentiment. Uh, this was a snapshot from the Bloomberg kind of price board uh, a bit earlier this morning. So as you can see, the losses in Asia, kind of three, five, six percent if you start moving over to Taiwan. Uh, but it's the year to date that starts to look uh, ever more frightening when it comes to uh, the Asia Pacific region, particularly that of China under the cloud of uncertainty that is trade wars because the Shanghai comp now is down in excess of 20%. Shenzhen is down over 30%. Uh, the Hang, Zang, Hang Seng in Hong Kong kind of getting close to that 20% marker as well. So uh, certainly emerging market disruption is still a, a, a key risk going forward. Uh, on that point though, one of the reasons why I think that um, not only is a correction at this point given the longest bull run in history I think uh, at some point was inevitably going to happen the other thing that I think is quite crucial here is that China have come out overnight and in their kind of state media press so ie the state back means it's basically the government talking they've said that China should get ready for more powerful policy measures possibly including large-scale stimulus packages to prevent its economy from stalling uh, amid these trade uh, frictions with the US at the moment. So as long as that's happening in my mind, at least as a short term uh, solution, I think that you know China collapsing is a big problem for global financial markets. But if the government are willing, as they have done in the past, to step in to mitigate uh, the persistency of the kind of deterioration in the economy, I think that then that holds true then that this correction won't materially worsen um, to the point of, you know, let's say if we look back at this S&P chart that we start pulling back down to, you know, levels down to 2600, down to the low of the February. Ugh, I find it really tough to think that we're going to get down to that point um, anytime soon. Uh, even then, if we did, I mean, 
starts to get interesting of you know the US economy is doing well at the moment uh, and maybe warranted some correction I'm sure the buy the dip uh, mantra might come back into play at that point a few other things for consideration uh, this <laughs> This couldn't be worse timed for our dear friend Donald, uh, because obviously the U.S. midterms now are uh, less than four weeks away, 6th of November, of course, and there's no better uh, reflection for the U.S. president, and has been clearly evident since his, his term uh, over the last two-year period, than defining the success of his policies by the strength of the U.S. stock market. So the fact that the stock market is, is seeing these um, some of the most sharp downside movements in the case of the Nasdaq in seven years, Donald Trump is not happy. Um, but quite the opposite of what every good trader should do, which is take accountability of a situation. Trump does the opposite. Point the finger. It's not my fault. Someone else's fault. So do I think that this is kind of cause for concern and you know his cri criticizing of Jerome Powell and the Fed uh, is going to be something that could just cause a market to sell off absolutely not I think that this is just purely you know politics he needs a get out of jail kind of angle here that the stock market is not weakening because of him if I was Trump I'd be saying look at you know the record low unemployment rate Look at how far we've come and all these sorts of things. It's Powell's fault for tightening policy that's causing this. So, you know, I think this is inevitable. Donald was always going to be singling out Powell at some point, given the Fed intention to continue raising rates. At this point, at where we stand at the moment, and with this sell-off having happened, the Fed... I think will still hike in December. Whether that holds true, it depends on how the next kind of few weeks obviously play out. If we did see a, a continuation of yesterday's move over multiple times, uh, obviously we'd need to get a hell of a lot lower in the stock market, I think, for the, the Fed to, to create panic. And we'd need a big fallout uh, in the emerging markets, I think. Those globalized threats in order to detract the Fed from the path it's on. Because let's not forget, the Fed are going to hike in deck and they're going to hike three times is what they're saying. It would be a big climb down uh, to alter that, to not hike in deck, because you've also got three hikes in December. Probably if anything was going to happen, 2019 trajectory might become slightly more shallow. Um, but the actual words, you know, yeah, you got to love uh, the US president. He called, he said, the Federal Reserve are going loco for interest rate increases uh, this year. Uh, that's not even making that up. That's actually what he said. He said the Fed are going wild. They're raising rates and it's ridiculous, uh, termed the president. So, yeah, this is all politics. This is all for him to control the kind of framework of the kind of build up for the political narrative going into the midterm. So I don't think this is uh, something Powell's going to be stressing about. I don't think it's something market participants are particularly fussed about either. The other thing, of course, that you'll get from Trump at this time, so this is what the Trump president does, and then his supporting cast come in to kind of cushion the blow, if you like. Uh, Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, US markets correction is not very surprising. So then he comes out in an IMF meeting, and of course, this is all just standard procedure. He comes in and massages the Trump kind of signal, don't worry. USA, things are fine, a correction was warranted, stock markets go up and down, they tend to overshoot in both directions. So again, this isn't really for us as, as market participants to trade or alter our strategies. This is all absolutely to be expected from the type of communication that you're going to hear from them. Uh, a quick look at some of the other assets though. Um, another one that's particularly interesting at the moment, of course, has been uh, crude oil. Now, flicking over, this is a daily continuation chart, and I wanted to start with the daily continuation. Let me just tidy up some of these lines, because we obviously had a, a pretty phenomenal rise in crude prices through the back end of September, really the last couple of weeks up until more recently. 
uh, and I'm talking about this kind of area here. This is through the second half of September, and it was only what 10 days ago we were up there pushing, you know, north of the 70, you know, getting up to 77. Uh, this came as a couple different things ongoing. Obviously, the US economy picking up uh, in terms of the economic data. We've got potential uh, supply disruptions with an inability to fill the gap of the impending uh, sanctions on Iran and the shortfall that could have on one of the biggest producers within the Gulf, and we shot higher. The thing that's happening now is if we start just taking this in a little bit is, you know, we've had, so this is the rise through what I've just uh, discussed. And then we've had a bit of a drop off and a couple of things to be aware of here. Obviously, panic about trade wars, uh, a sell off in the US equity market, the kind of higher yields. You know, let's not forget that, you know, the US 10 year yield in recent week has hit its highest since 2011. This idea then of, of kind of policy tightening being sped up has, you know, been a key you know, catalyst, if you like, for this, this stock market sell-off. But then if the global economy has to re-alter its kind of uh, expectations, then the demand for crude also drains, if you like, to some degree. So a little bit of a pullback. Uh, then in combination with some other things that have been playing out, um, so the trade war rhetoric continuing, no real solution being found as yet. And if China suffers... That has a net consequence for, for the demand for crude oil as well. But then there's also been some weather patterns which have been developing. And Hurricane Michael has been the one of which energy traders have been tracking. It became the, the strongest storm to hit the U.S. mainland since 1992. And it made landfall in Florida, slashing fuel demand in the southeast. So this is a little bit of a visual to give you an idea of the actual path of which this uh, hurricane is going and it's turned from production loss to demand destruction uh, is what people are saying uh, and just looking at where it's heading here the fact box and this is a really good website for these types of things uh, often you'll hear me talk about specific regions in North America and pipeline systems um, how I get the kind of granular detail to the actual um, all the specifics is by going to S&P Global Platts they're the benchmark kind of service provider for this level of detail. So they've released what's called a fact box. And this gives you everything really you need to know about these situations. Uh, so here, Hurricane Michael made land for category four, quickly destroying demand for power, natural gas and refined oil products. Uh, and as such, then in the short term, there's had to have been a bit of a net repricing of uh, demand for crude oil. So the severity of the storm surprised to the upside, which could uh, mean a longer lasting and more severe impact on demand for power, essentially. And if you're looking at those kind of regions on the map, it'll make a bit more sense. In addition to this, last night, of course, as well, we had the APIs, uh, a delay of a day, just accounting for the, uh, the holiday that we've had in the States. So the API crude oil build, 9.75 million is the biggest build since February of 2017. So, you know, this was way uh, exceeding the market expectations as per the, the, survey, the surveyed expectation. Cushing, a build of 2.3 million. So also bearish, biggest build since March 2018. Gasoline, biggest build since June uh, 2018. Distillates was the biggest draw since May of 2018. But you can see here, a heavily tilted bearish report. So Michael causing a short-term uh, repricing of the power demand out of the southeast region of the United States, uh, which is very key, of course. And then you've got this uh, cloud of uncertainty developing yesterday with the kind of sell-off, with a part being uh, kind of a, uh, the bite, if you like, of the trade talks ongoing. Uh, and then you've got this latest uh, API data. And so hopefully just making a bit of sense then of the renewed pressure that we've seen, in addition, obviously, as well, to a little bit of profit taking off after what was an incredibly aggressive run of the best part of north of 10 bucks over the period of about four or five weeks in oil. So uh, I think it's some profit taking there probably is warranted to a certain extent. I guess if we continue to pull back in oil, you know, maybe an, an interesting point start to come in uh, a bit lower down. Uh, 
just looking here these kind of low points from the late September period this kind of double top close from the uh, late August September point down at the 71 handle uh, if we should move lower not definitely not looking for a dramatic price fall here because ultimately in the medium term there still is the impending uh, Iran sanctions coming in there's not really a clear um, idea of what's going to happen to fill that shortfall US economy at this point is still growing and I think once we get through the midterms um, you know, the show will roll on again and so I think we'll find a bit of a flaw maybe around this area Uh, one of the other things actually just while we're on the charts I wanted to have a quick look at this was the yen um, or actually dollar yen uh, and yesterday obviously with the sell-off you're getting a bit of that continuation of uh, uh, the flight to quality move so strength in the Japanese yen uh, came down to uh, a level here where we found the floor of the price which was fairly interesting because it came in line with around the uh, September 14th high and an area of some support as well beyond that point on the 20th of September so that would be a level to keep an eye on should we see another sell-off and, uh, and a risk-off move in the session or sessions ahead uh, below there though the 111 handle I think is is pretty important for the reasons of I'm um, looking at the the deck future here hence the reason why the the prices are fairly thin on the left hand side but you can see that double top and that support point back on the, the 18th or 17th of Sep. And I think that's uh, a fairly solid point uh, if we were to ever come down to that, that area. But you can see the markets gathering and capturing their breath a little bit after yesterday's quite dramatic moves. Uh, Dolly Yen sitting back having recovered back to this point as well, where, which is quite interesting technically around that uh, 111.74. Uh, final thing on the news front to discuss, uh, of course, Brexit what is going on and we know that the timeline uh, for this week is important uh, obviously we've had Arlene Foster in meetings um, what would have been what yesterday and just reading the headlines this morning Brexit negotiators are said to be edging toward a compromise on the thorniest issue in talks even as officials on both sides warn that obstacles still remain so the point here being that uh, Michelle Barnier deal within reach Irish border still is the main kind of contentious issue. Can Theresa May uh, provide the backstop to appease the European bureaucrats? But can she get the DUP to swallow that and to continue backing her and her working government? Uh, the Telegraph reported late last night that agreement had been clinched and EU and UK officials warned in public and in private against predictions that a deal was in the bag. I still think that absolutely the champagne should be put on ice well, I think that this of course timings wise if you remember on the calendar it's pretty much this time next week that that EU meeting gets underway where we're supposed to be talking about then uh, the signing off of the framework of the Brexit deal to then be heard and voted and backed by the various European national parliaments and for us to bring it back home to UK Parliament to be voted upon I still think that that's quite a big ask um, and then the November emergency meeting will be probably more an accurate timing of when we might get to that point. Uh, so I, I still uh, would expect a little bit more Brexit noise in the coming days. The one thing for sure, though, is that we've had a bit of a back off in the dollar overnight. Uh, and in combination with what seems like a little bit of positivity in some of the Brexit um, talks for the moment and making some progress seems to be keeping uh, the cable pair elevated for the moment. So I'd still be very mindful of keeping a, a close eye on Laura Kunzberg, the usual kind of suspects on Twitter to try and capture uh, any developments on that on that front. Okay. Let's have a look at the calendar. For this morning, things are relatively quiet. I mean, just looking as we stand at the moment, uh, as I said, markets have kind of pause for breath a little bit, albeit a negative open following the, the falls overnight in Asia. Uh, the important part, again, I think will be what will happen when uh, North America come in. So, again, I think probably a more prudent or astute play might be just for strategizing for how to play out either a continuation of the moves from yesterday uh, or a reversal and at what points 
uh, technically it would be relevant on any move back to retrace some of the size of the move that we that we sold off across the indices. Um, my overall view here is that just looking at the calendar, the CPI numbers coming out this afternoon, I guess that could be quite a key catalyst. Let's say the core CPI is expected to, to tick up by 0.1. I think if we were to get a number up at the higher bound of the range, which would be 2.6, this is the core CPI, you can see that in recent months uh, we've only got to 2.4%. We had a bit of a pullback. I think if core CPI comes back to 2.3, 2.4, I don't think that's cause for concern on this yield kind of interest rate scare. If we got to 2.6% though, that does raise some alarm bells because then we start going back to levels we've not been for for, for a long period of time. Um, and that might then just kind of bring about this renewed fear of, uh, of, of rate rises. So I think that if there was anything that could act as a catalyst, if we were going to get a renewed uh, kind of sell-off, a high CPI core print could be that trigger. Uh, quite equally on the opposite, let's say if the core CPI remains subdued and we get another kind of consistent 2.2 or even lower, well then I think uh, we might have a bit of a recovery uh, at this point. Okay, elsewhere, weekly jobs data, I think that's a, that's a side point. I don't think that's really too meaningful for you guys to be concerned about. And then you've got the oil infantry numbers. Don't forget, because of the holiday, we've got delayed release. As per normal, that'll be at 4 p.m., not 3.30 London time. Speakers, uh, we do have a BOE speaker coming up at uh, 11.45 as well. Just be aware of for any sterling traders. Okay, that's it. So I'll let you get on with the day. I'll catch you in the chat room uh, and have a good day ahead. Thank you very much.